Hey, I'm John. And I'm Rick. And this is Ask an Engineer. This is actually the first episode of Ask an Engineer. So uh, maybe a historic moment, maybe a historic flop, but I think it's going to be fun. <laughs> yeah. Give, give us a break, guys. It might yeah. take a few minutes to get this together. So uh, Rick is the president uh, uh, of Royal Lab. I'm the vice president. And uh, we co-founded the company with uh, Raphael Viafani and, and Dave Royer. And it's been, uh, we, we started in 1998 and it's really been a, a great ride. But um, what I wanted to do really quick was just, uh, you know, Rick is the co-engineer with Dave. Everything that Dave has designed, Rick has co-designed with him at Royer and fleshed it out and turned it into the, uh, you know, the production models that they are. So I want to give you a little background on Rick and even less on myself. But um, let me just sort of introduce you here real quickly to, hang on. Oh, uh, of course, hang on just one second, because I'm not finding it all of a sudden, but that's always the way it goes. This is Need an the... engineer, John. Yeah, I do. Okay. I, I think I see what's happening. Just one minute. My keynote has crashed disappeared. There we are. All right. All right. So actually, John, you know, we started the company before 1998. Uh, we, I found the old business plan that we created and we started the company 96 and spent uh, a year setting up a, a lab for Dave and, and, uh, and developing the products. Yeah. Yeah. It was, um, a lot of work went into it before we actually started and we were kind of wandering around wondering exactly what we were going to do and then dave cooked up that first 121. yeah so uh so here's rick this is uh this is in in the early days he had a studio with rafael viafani called uh, babio recorders in la that was the one on the left <laughs> yeah, yeah right <laughs> so he's there with george harrison and uh babio and what did you guys record like why like, you recorded oh, boy, uh, we recorded kiss berlin red hot chili peppers a lot of the bands from the 80s berlin uh did their big one of their big hits out of there yeah um, Ki uh, yeah i said kiss george harrison of course yeah uh, jose feliciano didn't you do uh yeah, you did a lot of you did a few of the red hot chili peppers records right uh yeah also devo we did devo <laughs> and so uh, that was with bob margoloff the producing there was a lot, of, a lot of stuff back then. A lot of movie scores, too. Um, cool. Yeah. It was and, a pretty busy studio. Yeah, it was very busy. We, we were there from about 1980 to 92, I think, or 91. Something yeah, like here's, a, here's a shot. This is Rick. At, what are you, that's, like, in your no, That's 20s me in the studio A. I was engineering and producing a, a band there. And that was our Trident Series 80 uh, console. And then we switched over to Neve VRs. And actually, I like the sound of the Trident better. But uh, we were going for bigger fish, so you needed a Neve. Yep, everybody had to go for a Neve. Yeah. So after the studio days, uh, Rick and Ral had had enough of, of that, and uh, Rick started a little amplifier company in his living room, which turned into this. It's matchless. matchless. Yes. It's matchless. Yeah, those are those are a pair of amps that we built for Billy Gibbons, and they're covered in what's called shower curtain material. Very cool, very luminescent. Um, and he had a pair of those amps. I don't know where the, I don't know if he still has them, but that's the old factory we had in North Hollywood uh, before we moved to Anaheim. Wow. Wow. Then they moved to Anaheim and you were there for a couple of years and then got out. But uh, yeah, it got, too, it got too big to be fun. You know? Yeah. Like but uh, Rick was the president uh, and the production chief at that company, which is the same thing he does at Royer. Yeah. Uh, and the reason those amps have the reputation they do is Rick's kind of fanatical production um chops and yeah you know actually systems uh, he did as a side note when i was a little kid my father took me into a hi-fi store and i saw macintosh amplifiers and i just i thought they were so beautiful i kind of fell in love with them and the matchless amplifiers with all of that light up stuff and everything was really a homage to to uh to macintosh wow in fact the the name matchless i like the fact that it started with an m so wow Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've probably known you for 26 years. I did not know that. Yeah. Cool. So then the same things 
like I said, at Royer, he's the president of production chief, sort of that fanatical uh, precision oriented manufacturing thing, which is why Royers are made the way they are. So there's a well, bit about quality. handcrafted quality is it's yeah. a turn on for me. And then for my part, oh, this is, oh, check this out. This is the oh. original Royer shop. We, when oh, we started my. Royer, uh, Rick had bought a house with this, with a garage and a big space behind the garage to maybe start his next company after Matchless. And this was where Royer started. We were here for what, like five years, six years? Six years, six yeah. years until we outgrew it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That was a great place. That was a really cool shop. I, I actually think. enjoy going to work because uh, if I could fall out my bedroom, <laughs> fall right. out the back door, I could walk 50 feet to the to the front door of Matchless. I mean, of uh, Royer. Of Royer, right. Yeah. You know, in our early days, this was the booth we used to take to the trade shows. So yep. We just left it in the we shop and did a lot of testing in there. Yeah. Um, that was one of the workbenches um, that we yes. were. So all the early Royers were built uh, built in this space. That's right. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. So then, then on to me. This is this is my '80s days. I was a rocker in LA. I was playing the strip a lot, and um, I got out of that and 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 uh, started wearing a suit and tie downtown LA. Um, uh, worked in the data communications for a few years, which I really liked. But then I met this guy named David Royer, and he had some great design ideas. And we actually started our first company called DVA oh. in 95. And we didn't make it a year. I mean, there's a lot you need to know about running a business that we didn't know. But this was our, you know, uh, picture from the first uh, AES trade show, uh, our condenser mics and compressors and mic prees and stuff. And it was a great run. Uh, but during that time, we were talking about ribbons. And then Dave cooked up the first 121, which I have a picture of here. Yeah. Yeah. Brought this up to Rick one day and said, do you think we can sell? Is, is that what he said, Rick? I think we can uh, sell he, these. We were, he was re, we, we had set up a small lab for David. And David was creating all different kinds of condenser mics. And we discussed it. And we said, well, there's a lot of condenser mics out there. We you know, if we invest money and try to get a company going and uh, we put on another condenser mic, we're going to get lost with all the other manufacturers. So David got nervous when he heard this. And a week later, he came up and I was in my office and he, I remember distinctly, he came up and he put this thing right in my face. He goes, do you think we could sell these? And it was the, it was that prototype microphone. And uh, wow. that's what we said, God, ribbon mics, the new technologies that are available, the new uh, manufacturing procedure we could make we could do something with this and we we decided at that moment to give it a go yeah what a what a go that turned out to be uh and you'll notice it's got the mojave audio sticker on it dave had a little uh garage in his um or a company in his garage in fullerton that he called mojave audio and he used to just make one-off gear there so this is one of his one-off pieces yeah and that's what his old company was this is before royer existed yeah david and, uh, david was doing mojave audio back as, as in the early 80s, I think. 80s. Yeah. yeah. So it preceded, it preceded. Uh, this. Hey, there's... there's Joe Barisi. That 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 first 121 went to Joe, went to Joe Barisi. Oh, wow. He, he put it up on uh, Queens of the Stone Age before they were Queens of the Stone Age. He was working with this new band and uh, used it on the album. It was pretty cool. So that's the first thing it went up on. And Mike's got a little history. So anyway, there's a little, uh, little introduction to... to Rick and myself, and let's get out of this. And um, I figure because we, we've had thousands of questions literally come in uh, over over um, our website over the years. Uh, I've answered a lot of them. Rick's answered a lot of them. And uh, so I've got some questions that we've been asked in the past. Uh, please feel free to send any in. Uh, we'll get them and we'll answer them on uh, during this time. But I uh, figured today we're sort of so our first conversation about ribbons, you know, in this we're Ask an hanging, Engineer right? session. Right, John? We're just hanging, right? Just hanging. Just hanging. <laughs> just just chilling. Yeah. So we have been asked this. Uh, what's a ribbon mic compared to a condenser or dynamic mic? No, let me, hey, let me just take crack. <clears throat> well, dynamic mics and condenser mics share one thing in common. They usually have a round diaphragm. Condenser microphones operate by the uh, sound waves uh, cause a fluctuation in capacitance, and that capacitance is converted into a, an electrical charge, which then goes down the line into the mic preamp. A dynamic microphone 
uh, usually has a round diaphragm. And it's more like a speaker where you have a magnetic motor assembly and a coil and the sound waves stimulate the coil, the coil moves up and down in the magnetic uh, flux and that's converted into uh, electrical energy uh, off to your preamp. And there's one thing in common with both of those type of microphones, is they all experience what's called uh, resonances. Um, they call it the drum head effect. And those are um, I, distortion of, of sorts, but they make those microphones sound very bright. And when we were using recording tape as the medium, that brightness was really beneficial because as the tape wore, the tape motion wore down, it would, it would appear to retain the high end. Ribbon microphones are a little different. They're basically a, dy a dynamic mic where there's a powerful magnetic force and a flux. But instead of a round diaphragm, you have a very small flat ribbon that's been corrugated and it responds to sound waves. The difference between those types of microphones are that the ribbon microphone does not have the resonances that the dynamic and the condenser mics have, so it has a different sound. Yeah, like the, the resonance, uh, if, if you excite a, uh, a capsule, a, a condenser microphone capsule, its resonance, it's, it's going to resonate at about a kilohertz. And a ribbon element's going to resonate, like a Royer 121 resonates at 40 hertz. It's way down in the basement. Right. I've got a ribbon element here. Mm -hmm. Can you see that? That looks like an uncorrugated ribbon. Is that yeah. what I'm seeing, John? Yeah, that's just that's just a just a, an untreated ribbon. Yeah. It's 2.5 microns. You'd have to pile up about 40, 45 of these to get to the width of a human hair. Yeah. And it's uh, that's what's sitting in the uh, in the ribbon microphone. But uh, so maybe John, I could tell the, the folks out there what makes a Royer ribbon microphone different from the other ribbon microphones. Sure. And that would be our initial uh, patent. One of the things that uh, we noticed about vintage ribbon microphones and ribbon microphones of the day back in 1998 is that the ribbon was corrugated between a, two pieces of glassine paper. And what we noticed about that was that the corrugations were not very deep and there was relatively little work hardening of the, uh, the ribbon. So the ribbons were very, very delicate. And we developed a technique called the direct corrugating method where we had some very precise gears at a very precise tension and we would directly corrugate the ribbon. And the result was that <clears throat> you had a ribbon that was a, had corrugations that were very elastic because there was deep work hardening on the tips and valleys of the uh, corrugation. So that was a breakthrough, we think, for uh, ribbon mics. And then the other element of that was to, to offset the ribbon so that the ribbon was sitting um, proud of the gap. And as you drove the ribbon with the sound source, it would drive the ribbon more into the gap, making the mic more efficient the harder you drove it. So when you say proud of the gap, you mean like closer to the, to the front of the mic? Closer to the front of the mic, yes. Got it. Um, you know, let's just do this real quick. I've got, I've got some, some um, photos Mm -hmm. of what that looks like. like oh, here we go. Here's an old RCA corrugator. <clears throat> that is, that's an RCA uh, style corrugator. Yeah. And they're very crude gears. You can see that it's a pair of springs that are keeping the gears tightly meshed together. That That is not the way we would do it at Royer. Uh, right. What you would do with these is lay the ribbon on this tray between those two pieces of glassy and paper, turn the handle, yep. and then you get a ribbon like this. Exactly, yeah. Um, so you see, it's kind of a wavy pattern. This is the inside of an AA ribbon. AEA does incredibly good um, recreations of RCA mics. And so they use the RCA method to, to corrugate the ribbons and everything. Yeah. Uh, not knocking them at all, but this is... Um, this well, they, is get more, they get more of the vintage sound, John. You know, yeah. they're doing the same things that uh, RCA did with their... Yes. Uh, yep. And then what we did at Royer is Rick designed these killer corrugators uh, they literally sit underneath lights at Royer to keep the temperature right, and they run them through exactly. these gears directly. Yeah. And I've got a video yeah. oh, that uh, shows one of those going through. You want to? Yeah. By the By that? the way, John, those corrugators were built. We have six of them, and each one of them was about eight thousand dollars. <laughs> and the gears had to be made individually, and they're hard chrome so that they don't wear. 
Wow. And they're so precise. Here, check this out. This is, I mean, normally if you run a ribbon through gears, it's just going to come out confetti on the other end because it's such thin, fine material. But here's the, uh, here's a ribbon going into. Oh, that's an SF ribbon. That's real yeah. tiny. Really tiny. <clears throat> yeah. Ooh, that's cool. So it's going into the corrugator. Stop the video right there because you can see the ribbon coming out the other side. Yep. Then it hits this bull, and then you got that. And like Rick was talking about, that really yeah, tight corrugated pattern. Cor yeah, you see how deep the corrugations are, John? Yeah. <clears throat> well, the next step is to process that. Those corrugations are way too uh, radical, and the, the, the ribbon would just flop around uh, um, like an elastic in there. So what the guys do, and this is all done by hand, is they pre-tension the ribbon. They stretch it, they blow on it, they stretch it again until there's a certain amount of relaxation in the corrugations. And then they put the ribbon into the transducer and then they continue the process of clamping the, the ribbon down, um, uh, checking its resonance, which we do electronically. And then if, it's, uh, if, if it needs to come down, they'll blow on it, they'll stretch it, they'll, they, keep, they massage the ribbon into the right type of uh, the perfect corrugations and at the right resonance. And that's uh, really an art. It takes the, each guy that does that. It took him about a year to learn the technique. Yeah. We, uh, do you remember the, the day Eddie Kramer came in? Great engineer, oh. super curious guy, into everything. What a fun guy. But he comes into the shop and tries to, to <laughs> ribbon a mic. Yeah. I remember that. Good old You're like, bloody hell, this is hard. Because... Uh, you, you, you want to get that thing to drop in at 40 hertz. I remember doing it one day, the same day Eddie was in there, and I, okay, I get 100, all right? Loosen it. Okay, I got 20. Wow. Okay, tighten it. I'm back to 100. It's like, I just... Yeah. No, it's, I don't it's, understand. It's, art. it's an art form. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. And then so I think... The process got... of making microphones, but it's a real art form. That's, a, that's an R-series transducer, and you can see... Uh, the upper picture is the front of the transducer, and you can see that the ribbon is very close to the surface of the magnets, which are uh, creating the flux. And on, uh, let me see, yeah, that still looks like, and that's without the dampening screens. Then right. the lower picture is the same transducer with the dampening screens applied. <clears throat> and the purpose of the dampening screens are, they keep dust out, of course, and, and other foreign materials. But they also, the holes are so precise and they're, and the mesh is so many holes per inch that when the ribbon starts to vibrate with a sound wave, it'll actually build up a pressure in the transducer so that when the sound wave stops, that pressure will cause the ribbon to stop. That's called dampening. And that's part of what uh, makes the microphone sound the way it does. Cool. And engineers design they they pick that uh, that mesh according to what they want the dampening to be like right but there are some microphones that do not have a mesh at all and i i have some here um at the studio well um, but they and they do sound a little different and they're more fragile by the way of course yeah it's flop all over the place i would think mm -hmm. but um so, so this transducer see it's sort of in that rectangular shape it's that's what sits down inside of 121 dave Roy just cut this sort of slots in it, jam that transducer in, and those are the ears you see poking out the sides of a 121. Right, and that whole, the, the frame of that, uh, that uh, transducer that holds the magnets actually forms the return circuit, so it even strengthens the magnetic uh, flux. Nice. Yeah. And here, yeah, there's a shot of the 121. There you go, there's the 121. Yeah, so the, the, the transducer we were looking at, those are the edges of it, just popping out the sides of the mic. Yeah, you know, now uh, you can probably tell on the 121, the transducer frame and the barrel of the microphone are hard fixed to each other. And we have a microphone called the R10, where the transducer is completely shock mounted. So, and that microphone is very good for live or abusive situations. And uh, it's, it's a little different in design than 121. It shares the same ribbon size, the same ribbon width. Uh, same magnetic flux, but it was designed for a, a rougher application. Cool. So, so uh, really, the question was, what's you know, what's a ribbon? And now this is you know what ribbons are, how they're made, and really, you know that the in a condenser mic, the the capsule is the the motor what picks up sound, and in the in the um, ribbon mic, it's that ribbon element that's picking up sound. And 
guess what really sets a ribbon apart is that the way that it picks up sound is more like the human ear than other microphone types. And that's, we're not knocking other microphone types. Our sister company is Mojave Audio. We make condenser mics. Uh, Rick is a studio engineer. He's talking to you from Shabby Road, his studio, his home welcome, studio. Welcome to killer. Shabby, Shabby Road. Yeah. We're in the control room. He's got a lot of different mics there. Um, but condensers are, are great when you need more presence or you want some more highs or you want that sparkly vocal to cut through or you want your cymbals to be brighter. And if, if you've got something that you want to have recorded the way it sounds in the room, like you've got a, a great violin or a killer guitar cab or something, uh, a good ribbon microphone will get you there. It, when you pull up the faders, it's like you're hearing, it's like you're standing in front of the instrument, which is really nice. I mean, when I was, when I was recording some in the, in the 80s, I used to love standing in front of the amp and I used to hate going to the control room because what we captured was nothing like what was coming out of that amplifier. But with a 121, a uh, couple moves and go into the control room and it's just like I'm standing in front of the amp. You get that whole experience. And hey, let me let me add a little something to that, John. I think you've got a question that came in too. Um, the, uh, uh, the digital equipment that was starting to emerge at the same time that we came out with the, the 121 was fairly primitive. The sampling rates were very low. So when uh, the A to D converters were trying to extrapolate the information from a condenser mic, the, the, the little anomalies and the, the little resonances that were on top of the, the sound signal uh, would actually confuse uh, and be very difficult for an A to D converter to in interpret. So what they did was throw bits out uh, and that's what the reason that when you would play back a condenser mic that was recorded digitally back in those days, it would come back sounding more brittle and less natural than what you heard in the room. And ribbon microphones, uh, one of the great things about that, it doesn't have those resonances. And when you uh, went through the A to D process and came and played it back, it sounded more natural, more like what you sounded like in the room. That was one of the great coincidences of when we started Royer. It was the early days of digital recording when engineers were going a little crazy with the early A to D converters and things. And then a ribbon would just sail right through there. Uh, and because it's a very simple signal. Yeah. And uh, John, it, a lot of people said they felt like they were working with tape again. Yeah. John, did you get a question sent to you? I did. So, so, uh, Jory Herman basically, let's see, yes. Is there a resurgence in the popularity of the ribbon mic? Why or why not? That is a huge resurgence in Definitely. the popularity of ribbons now. Um, it's uh, not just Royer. There are a number of other companies making ribbons now. Uh, but when we started, there were very few being manufactured and they weren't very popular. But people are seeing them in wide use. Uh, you know, the proliferance uh, the, of, of them on electric guitars and drums and things um, really helped them catch. But they're also huge in the classical world now. I mean, Joshua Bell or Yo-Yo Ma... Uh, very often you see a Royer SF2 over their head. Um, Arturo there's Sandoval also, on the trumpet at 122. There's a lot of... Also, John, there's the combination of using a condenser mic and a ribbon microphone to get the benefits of each each type of microphone. You get Absolutely. the and, and the bottom end of the ribbon, and then you get that nice sparkly top of the condenser when you blend them together. You get a, an incredible sound. Yeah, yeah. or like uh, like a, or on an electric guitar, a... Uh, Everyone's gotten used to that sort of mid-range punch of the um, 57, but it's very bright and you're, lit, you're, you're lacking the low end stuff. You blend a 121 and a 57 and blend those faders and wow. Which is so, why we came out with the ax mount, right? Yeah. yeah, because so many people are blending it, now you can stick them in one mount. But yeah, um, uh, Jory, the, the ribbons have become a lot more popular. Nobody knew what they were. Digital recording gets started. Royer gets started at the same time. And it really seemed to be an answer to the digital problem. As a matter of fact, in 2013, we got a technical Grammy. And what they said was that Royer and Ribbons really helped get through the, the early digital systems and all digital systems because they come across so naturally yeah. in digital recordings. So uh, mm -hmm. thanks for the question. Uh, got another question here. Let's take a real look. Uh, do you recommend vacuum tube or solid state preamplifiers for use with ribbon mics? Because ribbons are already really warm. Won't a tube mic pre make them sound too warm? 
Uh, well, actually, no. Uh, two two preamps uh, are very fast with transient response. The only thing that I would make a comment on is that um, the low output of many ribbon microphones, especially passive ribbon microphones, uh, when you start adding a lot of gain and you start adding a lot of gain with a tube preamp, the noise level might be more noticeable, which in the digital world that we live in, where there's virtually no noise, uh, almost any noise is, uh, is uh, brought to the observer. So I, I think that's, that there are great uh, vacuum tube preamps that sound wonderful with a ribbon microphone. They don't make them sound too warm, but I think solid state preamps may be more accepted because they're very quiet. Cool. So folks, this is uh, we're at 25 minutes. These are not wow, that really went. long. I know we're, yeah. we're having too good a time ourselves. So, uh, look, so this was episode one. We're gonna we we have many questions about ribbons, and we want to take more of your questions. So, uh, we ha don't have any others at this time uh, that are coming in live. So we will come back. Uh, what Rick in a week or two and do that? Do the sure. next one. Yeah, sounds great. Also, John, if people have questions they want to direct right to me. Uh, on our website, there's a uh, feature called Ask an Engineer, and they can send in any questions they want. Sure, send questions in, and then we'll, we'll address those on the show too. So the next time we get together, we'll be going down a whole lot more questions rather than the whole introduction and everything. We just uh, wanted to do that. So Sounds good. You know, give All us right. a minute to talk about ourselves. It's cool. <laughs> thanks, so, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Bye, John. Bye, Rick. <laughs>